Good morning. Good morning. We are so glad you are here with us this morning to celebrate the beginning of Easter week. This is Holy Week, right? Today we celebrate that Jesus is the one who is sent in the name of the Lord. What a blessing. I have been asked, um, just as part of that celebration and also because we love and honor her, um, Pastor Ellen is... She's gonna, you just get ready. She knocks it out of the park today. I can tell you that. I've already heard the sermon, and the Holy Spirit is moving extra, extra much in her life today. But uh, would you do her a huge favor? She loves your love. But if you're crying or just overwhelmed with emotion, will you give her a little break? Because it's a little too much for her right now. So if you could do that as a gift, she, you can love her from a little further away if, if you're crying, but if you just want to love on her and give her a pep talk and a little encouragement, boom, knock that out of the park. But just out of respect for her, would you do that for me? And I know that's a strange request, but, but we need her to make it for, through for all of us today, and I don't think she can do that <laughs> without it. Um, I want to remind you that because it is Holy Week, our schedule this week is, is fast and furious. We have all our normal Tuesday activities, all our normal Wednesday activities, and then on Thursday we'll have a Mondi service here in our sanctuary at 7 o'clock. If you don't know what a Mondi ser Thursday service is, that would be make two of us. But what it is is we celebrate the day that we celebrate the Lord's Supper and the institution of that. Because we do not have a Good Friday service, our Mondi Thursday service will kind of cover both. And uh, we really encourage you to come. It'll be a very special time. Um, Saturday, we have an Easter egg hunt for your children, your grandchildren, your friends, whoever you want to bring. That's at 10 o'clock here at our church. Sunday morning, we will start and celebrate with the sun coming up at 7 a.m. And um, we'll do that right on the other side of this wall. It is a very uplifting, encouraging service to celebrate the moment that the women discovered the tomb was empty, which is what this is all about, right? And then we will have two services, our 845 service and our 1115 service. They will be identical. Um, as much as two services can be identical, these two services will be identical. They're going to be a hybrid, a hybrid of our early service mixed with our late service. And then I would describe it on steroids. So uh, we're going to have a full orchestra, the full praise band, the choir, children's choir. I mean, it's going to be big and it's going to be awesome. And I really encourage you, if communion is something that you want to do, we will have communion on Thursday night and at sunrise. Those will be where we do communion. And at WOW, of course, on Wednesday. 
I'd like to welcome you and thank you for being here, and I'm sorry for the long announcements. The rest are written, and all those that I just said are actually written in the bulletin as well, if you want to look at that. But now let's prepare our hearts for worship with our bell choir. Amen. Thank you so much. I forgot to welcome you, so I'm so glad y'all are here. And I do ask you, take a moment and fill out that little red notebook. And if, it's, if this is your first time to be with us, we do have a present for you at our welcoming desk. So please stop by there and ask any questions um, that you might have or just to check in and say hello. Would you stand with me and join me in the call to worship? Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. He comes with joy and hope. He comes to set us free from fear. Hosanna. Hosanna. Glory to God in the highest. And that was it. <laughs> Let's remain standing. Let's sing as we celebrate. Wait, no, we pass the peace first, right? Y'all threw me off. There's no little squiggly lines. Squiggly lines. <laughs> Let's pass the peace.
part of Palm Sunday. <laughs> Would you be seated? And, and uh, children, why don't y'all stop, turn around and come on up here for the children's time, because that's what it says right here. Come, come, come. How's everybody this morning? morning. Yeah, don't touch that one. Don't touch it, okay. okay. I'm going to put it over here, so be real careful. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. How, whoo, boy, do we have a lot of people here. Well, we're going to talk about that. Okay, he just said, boys and girls, do you know what this is? A crown. I see some boys over there in a crown. I see, I see. Okay. So we have a crown here this morning. When I was teaching, sometimes when we had a student of the day, I'm going to put it right here on her head. She's the student of the day. So if she's the student of the day at school, okay, better? All right. When you're a student of the day, somebody raise their hand and tell me what might happen if you're a student of the day. Yes, sir. Ooh, games instead of work. Awesome, awesome. What else? Yes, ma'am get to eat cake. Woo, you're lucky. Yes, sir. They do more work? More work? I don't know about that one. What do you think? Ooh, get to play on electronics. Oh. Pass out papers. Go to lunch first. What else? You get what first? Oh, okay. Well, that's awesome. You get a lot of special privileges. The only bad thing is that it only lasts for how long? One day. One day. Whoops, sorry. No more. It only lasts for one special day. Well, you know what? 2,000 years ago, about 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, there was a king visiting the city came to the city, and there were people that put palms on the floor like you just did. Some of them took their coats off and put them on the floor, on the ground, because this king was riding into town on a donkey. Do you know who that king was? It was Jesus, right. And he was like king for the day. Do you, do you remember, did Jesus wear a crown like this? No. He did not. He, he, later on, he did. He did not wear a crown like that. He just was like a regular guy, wasn't he? Yeah. But you know what? As excited as they were about Jesus coming in, and they were, what were they saying? Do you remember what song we just sang? They sang Hosanna. Everybody say Hosanna. Hosanna. All the people that were saying Hosanna kind of changed their tune. They went from... Uh 
Okay. Okay. That's right. They went from praising Jesus to turning against him. And he was arrested. And what else? He was tried. And he was what? Do you have something? Is it about our story? Okay. That's right. We're going to get there. At the end, what happened? They went from a beautiful crown to a crown of thorns. Do you want to wear this? No, 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 no. <laughs> Nobody's going to wear this one. Nobody's going to wear this one because it's sharp. It's really made of thorns. But who did have to wear that? Jesus. Jesus. He sure did. Okay. All right. Jesus wants us to be the ruler, wants him to be the ruler and the Lord of your life. Can you say that Jesus is the Lord of your life? Can everybody say that? Jesus is the Lord of my life. He doesn't want to be your king for the day. He wants to be your forever king. Give me that. Forever king. All right. Can I have praying hands? Okay. Praying hands. Jesus, we adore you. We come as our, we can crown you as our Lord and King. We crown you as our Lord and King. We give our lives, we give our lives in, service to you. in service to you. Not just for today, Not just for today. but always. always. Amen. Amen. All right, and yay, Jesus, everybody. Yeah. Jesus. All right. <laughs> Boys and girls, today Miss Tracy has a book for you called The Unexpected King. Back in the back. Hey, I think we need to give it up for Miss Irene filling in today. What do y'all think? <laughs> Tracy's a... Uh, took a weekend off to be with their family, and they went to Washington, D.C., and I don't think they told Irene that Palm Sunday was one of those days all the kids come, <laughs> so we need to give her lots of love today. She rocked it. Wasn't that awesome? <laughs> awesome, man. That's great. You're good. We'll get it later. What a good kid. Gage, you are a superstar right here. <laughs> Well, as the ushers come forward, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gifts you've poured out on us. They are more than we could ever count. God, we thank you for the blessing of life, the blessing of this beautiful place to live and to worship. We pray, Jesus, as we give back to you the gifts of tithes and offerings, we ask that you bless those, God, and you help us to use them to go out and to share that love with the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs>
Please rise and join me in the doxology. seated. Would you join me in prayer? <laughs> Almighty God, you have given us so many things. You have blessed us. Today we come and celebrate that you are our king and that we should say praise be to you, God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, help us to hold on to that promise that you are Hosanna. You are God with us. You are our Prince of Peace. God, we know that there are many in our church who need your love, who need your healing, and we are going to lift those up to you right now. We pray for Peggy Adcox, Courtney Allen, the family of J.J. Baskin, Ray Baumgartner, Ben Butler, Dale and Mary Carey, Jean Collins, Al Davis, Dinna Day, the family of Marguerite Dyke, Hubert Ellison, Nancy Fowler, Stephanie Fowler, Bob Gall, Curtis Gray, Bob Cassingham, Vi Gordon, Larry and Hazel Hamlin, Pete Hibbler, Paul Hicks, Bill Johns, Jim Coleman, Tiffany Lucia, Ginger McCann, Jill McDaniel, the Norton family, Carol Parker, Blaine Powell, James Powell, Bob Powers, Guy Robinson, Donovan Rude, 
B. Sanders, Ori Sanford, Rodney Short, Kathy Soames, Kevin Statler, Gail D. Gail T. Gardner, Leslie Trish, Jack Wesner, Wade White, Bud Whitehead, Sam Wilson, Billy Wimberly, John Woolley, Elnora Wooten, Bob Cassingham, Johnny Wilson. God, we pray for those in our church that are suffering with cancer. We pray for John Berlin and Jimmy Bibles, and Joe Boyd, Travis Campbell, Norma Davis, Dean Domont, Bob Dyer, Ellen Ely, Carson Eubank, Jeannie Flynn, Jack Furr, Mary Gurno, Carol Hoff, Ray Hufford, David Inman, Harry Jackson, Sherry Jones, Henry Jackson, Tammy Jones, Carolyn Kendrick, Katie Meyer, Kevin Mott, Debbie Pack, Ray Pride, Doug Redler, Charlie Robertson, Ellie Rodriguez, Kathy Rose, Shelley Stewart, Mary Lee Webb, and Cindy Walden. And now, God, we lift up those that are nearest to our hearts this morning. Mighty God, each and every one of these are your precious children. We pray, God, for your lambs. We pray that you hold them in their, your arms and you restore them to life, and to life in its fullest. We look forward to the day, God, when we are not praying for these names, but we are celebrating the healing that you have done. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. We thank you that you are active in the lives of each and every one of us and every name that we have lifted up today. And God, in response to all that you have done for us, we pray the prayer your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 12 through 26, and it is entitled, Jesus' Triumphal Entry into Jerusalem. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they went with branches of palm trees and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, 
we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. The Lord add his blessing to these words. Thank you, Carol Ann. Good morning, church. It is good to see you here this morning. I was in Houston last week, and I'd rather be here any time and twice on Sunday. Right? <laughs> Have y'all been to Houston? You know what I'm talking about. Won't you pray with me? Holy God, hear our prayer. That the word that is spoken and the word that is heard this day may be for us by the power and inspiration of your Holy Spirit, the Word of God. Amen. I won't embarrass you by asking for a show of hands, but if you read my newsletter article this week, you know that I quoted that incredible philosopher, Forrest Gump. Life is like a box of chocolates, right? You never know what you're going to get. That's right. Isn't that the truth? If anyone had ever told me that I would be diagnosed with breast cancer, I would have laughed. I have no maternal family history. I have 20 years of clean mammograms. And yet here we are. That which I never expected has come to pass. Sometimes life throws curveballs, doesn't it? Surprise, surprise. You never know what you're going to get, right? Parenthetical comment, ladies, get your mammograms. I'm serious. This never would have been detected until it was too late had I not had a mammogram. Okay? End of sermon. That sermon, anyway. <laughs> Sometimes the things we get and the things we expected are two very, very different things. And that lesson can apply to many facets of our lives, right? I bet the disciples really were confused by Jesus most of the time because Jesus was always surprising them. As soon as they anticipated his next move and they were ready to follow him in his next steps, he did something different, something they couldn't have anticipated. Today we celebrate Palm Sunday and the children came down. Wasn't that wonderful a while ago? The children waving the palm branches. One of the children told me, I ran out a minute ago, and one of the children said, there were so many people I couldn't get around all of them. Isn't that great? Thank you for being here so the children can get around you. That was awesome. A great way to start, as we recall today, Jesus' triumphal entry into the great city of Jerusalem. The people there came and they cheered for him, as Carol Ann helped us while ago. Hosanna, right? Can you do that with me? Hosanna. <laughs> Hosanna to the son of David. That's what they cheered. They threw palm branches into his path, which were symbols of victory. The Gallup or the Rasmussen polls of the day would have been over the top because he was so popular in that day and time. Can you imagine what the disciples must have thought of all the hoopla? Don't you know they were all puffed up and proud and excited and, wow, look at us, right? Don't you know they thought everything was going in a completely different direction? These people were really excited because finally they get it. Finally, the people they had been talking to and that Jesus had been talking to realized he's a king. Hello. It took a while, but they finally came along. They probably thought they had scored a tremendous victory that day, and they were ready to kick off a huge campaign. And Jerusalem, what a perfect place. It was the largest, most cosmopolitan city in the, re in the region. The disciples were celebrating the victory. It was the day they'd been waiting for. They were so proud of all the work they had done. 
And then later in this chapter, in verse 24, we hear these words. Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now I wonder how the disciples heard those words, having just felt so puffed up, so victorious, so celebratory. I mean, don't you know that we're frustrated with Jesus saying, Jesus, let's don't do any backtracking here. Look how far we've come. Look how great everything has become. And now everything's going our way and you're talking about death? You know, that's Ellen assuming that's what they would be saying because everything was so confusing to them. Again, Jesus kept them on their toes. He's never been as popular as he is now, so why is he talking about death? and challenges, and obstacles, and all this mysterious stuff about dying. The disciples really seem to get nervous in verse 26 when Jesus says, Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. We look at Jesus' gift, the gift of eternal life. We look at the unimaginable glory that goes with that. And we, like the disciples, are confused because now Jesus is talking about all this other stuff. Because we say, yes, Jesus, I want to be your disciple. Count me in. That sounds wonderful. I want eternal life. And suddenly we're not so sure. Because we really realize, because Jesus starts telling us about the things that are necessary for discipleship, and suddenly we're not so sure. When he says, you have to serve the poor and the needy. Wait a minute, Jesus, we're going to go live in a castle. We have a new kingdom here. We're going to go into the world and we're going to spread the message. We're going to take up our cross and we're going to die to our self-serving nature. What? Now, wait a minute, Jesus, this isn't the direction we were going. On second thought, I don't know. I know that following Jesus is incredible, But now he's talking about all this stuff we have to do to be disciples in every sense of the word. And it really means we have to give up everything. And I'm not so sure I want to do that. And yet that's exactly what the master is saying. Jesus' followers then and Jesus' followers now have to make a decision. The disciples are beginning to see that this discipleship thing is not at all what it was cracked up to be. Surprise, surprise. There comes that box of chocolates. A lost job. A cancer diagnosis. A broken relationship. What? That's not what we thought was happening here. You expected one thing and you got a big surprise. You never saw it coming and suddenly your life has changed. My brothers and sisters, what do we do now? What is our next step? What happens in your life when one thing happens and it changes everything? It changes the whole landscape of your life. Something that you thought you could count on is suddenly not so secure after all. Surprise, surprise. I don't think I'm ever going to forget going to bed Monday night, March 16th, knowing that I was going to get a call the next day that might change my life forever. And I don't think I'm ever going to look at St. Patrick's Day the same ever again. (laughs) You know, I'm innocent. I got my green shirt on. I'm going over here to the hospice-style show in Burnett. And I have my cell phone laying on the table expecting the doctor to call. And we leave and she hasn't called. And I get home 10 minutes and the parsonage phone rings. And on the caller ID, I see the number. And I pick up the phone and I hear her voice. The doctor's voice. Friends, when the nurse calls, it's okay. When the doctor calls, not so much. And she said, you know, it's not good news. Do you want to come to my office to talk about it? No. I want to know right now. (laughs) My husband is sitting here. I'm putting you on speaker. Talk to us. What are we looking at? And what she had to say, frankly, was very discouraging. Still mad about that, by the way. She doesn't have very good bedside manner. (laughs) Phone side manner. 
My friends, in the last 10 days, Wade and I have had a lot of conversations, a lot of sleepless nights. How do you have courage facing a battle when you're afraid? I've never thought of that before. I know some of you have, because some of you have been where I stand right now. How do you do that? How do you juggle those things? How can you be courageous in the face of battle? I don't think Jesus was unsympathetic to the fears of the disciples. He understood it was human. Fear is a human emotion. It's a human instinct. It's a part of who we are. And remember, Jesus was part human and part divine. And so he could understand and relate to what we feel. After our lesson is over in verse 27, I jumped one verse. It says, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus says that his soul is troubled. So my friends, don't you think he understands our souls when they are troubled? Don't you think he can relate and understand and have compassion upon us when we face a mountain that we've never faced before because it is so tall and so scary? I think Jesus' words help us hold on to our faith. I said that in my newsletter article. I think in times like this you grab hold of scripture and you hold it even more tightly. The reality is very often in our life we plan things and it's so nice looking on paper, isn't it? And it's so neat. And then, surprise, surprise, suddenly something comes out of nowhere that you never saw, you never expected. And we get so disappointed, like the disciples got so disappointed in this lesson, they had it all figured out. Jesus was going to be the king who wore the crown of jewels. Did y'all see that beautiful crown a minute ago? They were going to live in a castle, all of them. He wasn't going to wear a crown of thorns. That wasn't in the plan. That wasn't written out anywhere. Jesus would reign over all those who had persecuted him. All the wrongs would be righted. Instantly. We'll show them. We'll pay them back for everything they've put us through. This week as we begin the journey of Holy Week, and it is a journey, we'll consider some of these things in more depth. And we'll remember that no one was ever more in God's will than Jesus. And they murdered him. So the fact that things in our life don't always turn out the way we plan so neatly doesn't mean you're not in God's will. Amen? Have we all experienced things that just hit us in the face that we never saw coming? It doesn't mean we're not in God's will. Sometimes other things just intervene. Like crowns of thorns. And crosses. And cancer. Surprise, surprise. Jesus wasn't going to declare himself king over Jerusalem or over the Jews or over the Roman Empire. He had bigger plans. By his death. Jesus broke down the wall between humanity and God in a way that only he could do. And when he did that, he gave us eternal life through his death. So my brothers and sisters, no matter what happens in our life, we can have the confident assurance that he goes before us, that he walks with us, that he holds our hand, no matter how tall the mountain appears to be. And friends, when things don't go according to our plans, surprise, surprise, the disciples learned, as we will, that that gives us an opportunity to go deeper into our faith and to hold on more tightly. I must admit, through all these tests and screenings and even the biopsy on Friday the 13th, who has a biopsy on Friday the 13th? <laughs> that stuff that we were going through this sounds sacrilegious and I don't know maybe it is but I kept saying Lord if it's possible take this cup from me this cancer cup but not my will but thine be done that's hard some of you have done that too I've always considered myself a person of deep faith but I think our faith finds more depth when we have to hold on because things just got a whole lot harder. Some of you may know that as well. 
when you buckle your seatbelt and you put on your crash helmet and you get ready to go and fight the demon called cancer or whatever it is. The disciples had every idea how everything was going to work out because it was so carefully orchestrated and laid out. And I believe they trusted God. I believe they trusted, but their world was blown apart as the journey didn't go to a castle. It went to a cross. They thought the journey would go to that earthly kingdom where they could be puffed out and proud and excited and wear all the fine garments and live in a castle and be wealthy. No more fishing and sleeping on the dirt. My friends, I must admit, I have no idea. I'm, you know, be honest, I have no idea where my path is going to take me. Even though I'm scared, I have every confidence that God will hold my hand every step of the way. And I know that He will do that through your prayers, through your support through the grace and the healing power of Almighty God. That is the most and the best I can hope for. And a gift I have been given that I will never be able to thank God enough for is the gift of Wade Hibbler, that rock that walks beside me in everything I do. It's hard to be a preacher's husband, I'm sure. I don't know. But he has been tested in the last ten days, as I have. And I give thanks to God for Wade, for God's mercy, for God's healing, and for God's abiding and constant presence. And when I'm thankful, I say, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for your presence with us. No matter what mountains we climb. We thank you that you've already been there. We thank you that you know the path and that you don't let us know what it is at this point. That you keep us shielded. But I pray, oh God, that every step we take, personally and as a church family and as a community, that we follow your lead. And that we have the confidence that you will hold our hand, that you will walk beside us. Thank you, oh God, for your everlasting presence. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, who is the healer, we pray. Amen. This is a great hymn, but it's going to be kind of hard to sing today. Uh, number 298, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. All kidding aside, Joni, great hymn. This is a great, great hymn. It's a perfect hymn for us today, for this time in our Lenten journey as we approach Easter. So as we stand and sing this song, if there are those who would unite with our church, if there are those who want to just come to the rail and pray, if you would like John or myself to come, extend your hand so we know you want us to do that. Otherwise, we'll let you have your time with God. Let us be standing as we sing.
going to invite my husband to come because, believe it or not, my talking's not so good right now. Uh, he does that a whole lot better than I do. And uh, I have something I want to say, but he's going to have to be the mouthpiece. So if you'll bear with us for just a moment. First off, from my family, I want to thank each and every one of you for your prayers, sweet emails, text messages, all the hugs, everything that you've done. We really appreciate it. The one thing I want to do right now that I think is extremely important, this cancer is an evil demon, it really is. If you are staring into the face of this beast, if you're fighting with cancer or you have survived cancer, would you come up and stand with Ellen? Come stand with her this morning. You can see that this demon has affected a lot of this congregation. It really has. And you know, there's a language that comes with cancer. The language of cancer, words like biopsy, ultrasound, mammogram, stereotactic biopsy, clear margins, positive margins, MRI, plastic surgery, ductile carcinoma, HER2 and KI67, the language of a demon, cancer. One in five of our women in this congregation will either face it or have faced it. Today, over 30 of our congregation are on the prayer list for various forms of this demon we call cancer. What is our response? As the body of Christ, we pull together and we pray. It's the most powerful weapon we have, prayer. Because prayer does bring healing. Prayer does help us find a way to also look for the hope of a cure. On behalf of my family, I want to thank you for your prayers. This body of Christ is a mighty prayer warrior, and the words that cross your lips have made a difference and will continue to make one, not just for Ellen, but for all of these people you see standing here. And it's because of that prayer, we will stomp this demon into the ground. Thank you. I realize that for some of you, it's hard to come up here because you've been down this road and it's still rather raw or maybe you're still in the journey. So thank you for coming down as we acknowledge the demon that it is and the demon that we will slay in time and with God's grace and God's healing. My brothers and sisters, thank you so much for coming down here. Thank you for the testimony that you give as you stand here. I appreciate it so much and I know that God will bless all that you continue to do. Don't go anywhere, but before I pronounce the benediction, I have been reminded to bless the meal, okay? And you're going to help me do that. There's a meal. Did anybody know there's a meal? We Methodists kind of draw ourselves to the kitchen, right? We have an enchilada dinner, I understand, in the kitchen, and it's smelling good, so let's sing the Wesley Grace together. Won't you stand? Be present at It's been many years since I stood before you with my hands shaking, but they're shaking this morning. Somebody told me after the first service, you know, Ellen, this is just old dirty face. Don't let him get to you. Words well spoken, right? My brothers and sisters, go in peace. Go in the trust and the knowledge and the love of God, the one who is the great physician and the one who is in the case and on the job. Thanks be to God for his presence and his glory.